Good morning, everybody. At the outset, uh, I would like to thank the Academy for the fellowship and also for inviting me here to share our work with the fellows and uh, invited guests and other students of the Academy. In fact, we work on uh, four different areas, in four different areas, which are very similar and all of them are towards use of the natural immune response of the plant to protect the crop from the fungal diseases, particularly fungal diseases. And the topic that I'm going to talk is uh, a kind of a, a serendipity where we just bumped into, where we were not looking at this aspect, but we were uh, forced to learn and then uh, understand a little more of this aspect that is about the transglycosylation by bacterial chitinases. I'll come to that. The, as I said, this is my interest. We all enjoy when the plants are green. We all get good uh, food and all other kinds of things from these plants. And for that, the plants got to be healthy. And since it is a, a general audience, I just wanted to also tell you, there are thousands of different infectious agents which can cause diseases of plants. <clears throat> when there are thousands of agents which can cause diseases of plants, we still find a lot of plants healthy and we are able to get all the products that we are getting from the plants. It would not have been possible if the plants were not having their own immune system to fight against these organisms and survive against the pathogen stress. At least two different types of immunity have been identified. I would say one, could, one is popularly referred these days as uh, pathogen triggered immunity and the other one is an effector triggered immunity. Both of them are uh, operate at two different levels in plants. And this pathogen triggered immunity or pathogen associated molecular pattern triggered immunity, what we call is more a broad kind of a resistance which is operated by the plant against variety of infectious agents. If the plants were not having this kind of immunity, there would not have been plant species to survive today and maybe we would not have been here to discuss anything about the science if there were no plants to be there. What is that pattern that the plants are recognizing? I, these are all simple pictures that I have shown for all of, for all of you here. Each one of them we uh, clearly remember. Once we see this, we know what it is. And it is a, a pattern that is imprinted in our mind. And when we see this, we try to run away from that. And when we see this, for example, this banana, even in the night if somebody gives us uh, this banana fruit, and if we feel it from one end to the other end, we will be able to say that it is banana, even if it is completely dark. It's possible because this is imprinted on our mind. And how is that the patterns of the infectious agents are recognized by the plant to activate their pattern recognition, but the pathogen triggered immunity is uh, something which has been understood for the last uh, maybe 20 years in more detail. And all our work has been uh, centered around that either in the understanding the uh, mechanism of non-host resistance or making use of bacteria for the protection of the plants against the fungal diseases or use of pathogen produced molecules through a nanoparticle based method to deliver into the plants and induce immunity in plants or the fourth one which I am going to talk which is little similar, not too similar to the first talk that is synthesis. Something I'm also going to talk about some synthesis, but it is not like the ideal synthesis. It may not be a, a chemical synthesis at all. You look at this, these are some insects which can uh, damage the plants. These are some fungi which can cause damage to the plants. These are bacteria which can cause damage to the plants. What is that in common on all the surfaces of these agents which are ca causing damage to the plants? The surface of the insect exoskeleton, the fungal cell wall, the bacterial cell wall, all three have something in common that is a carbohydrate. And 
particularly between fungus and insect, what is shared is chitin. Chitin is the primary constituent of the uh, cell wall of the fungus and also that of the insects, exoskeleton. Whereas for the bacterial cell wall, we have something called a glycan structure linked to a peptide group, where we call it as a peptidoglycan. In, in other words, something like carbohydrate molecules or carbohydrate linked to peptides present on the surface of these organisms can serve as the patterns for recognition by the plants. And that is what the plants have been doing, recognizing those patterns. And uh, ca carbohydrates are only one type of patterns that can be that are recognized from these agents. Multiple uh, patterns of these organisms can be recognized by the plants because they have to survive against their stress. Varieties of these kinds of uh, pattern recognition receptors are identified in the plants, varieties of them. Out of these, this uh, the receptor, the pattern recognition receptor which has an extracellular couple of lysome domains is the one which recognizes the carbohydrate ligands. Carbohydrate ligands from the infectious agents are recognized by the lysome module containing pattern recognition receptors and in turn they activate a kinase domain, intercellular kinase domain and then activate the defense response in the plants. And there are all others are for different types of molecules. For example, if it is a proteinaceous uh, ligand the, with which it has to interact, it is the loosen rich repeat uh, pattern recognition receptor which is active in the plants. And if some uh, uh, patterns escape and if there are some pathogens which can deliver the molecules right into the plant cell and escape this recognition mechanism. And in that case, there are intercellular pattern recognition receptors which will recognize those patterns and then activate another level of resistance. If the pathogen is clever in injecting the molecule right into the plant cell, the plant is also clever activating a much higher level of resistance which is more specific against the pathogen. That is what we call it as affected triggered immunity. So, and there is another situation some of you may be aware the plants also interact with beneficial organisms. And even those beneficial organisms have the carbohydrate ligands. Then how is the difference? How is that the plant is able to distinguish between a beneficial, the ligand coming from a beneficial organism versus a ligand which is coming from an infectious agent? What we know is the rhizobium, a typical example is a rhizobium which forms nodules in the uh, roots of the plants which form the carbohydrate ligand is a chitin oligosaccharide there, but the, it is hooked to a, lipo, a lipid component. It is called lipid chitin oligosaccharide. Whereas the component, the, the, the pattern that is coming from the pathogen is exclusively a carbohydrate which is a chito oligosaccharide. So either if it is exclusively a chito oligosaccharide, it is recognized as a pathogen derived molecule. When it is tacked to a lipid receptor, lipid the component, it is recognized for a symbiotic pathway. So I, depending, on, depending on the type of ligand with which the plant is interacting, the receptor is interacting, it will either activate a signaling pathway for symbiosis or will activate a pathogen triggered immunity, it, it all depends. So now a lot of, this is only uh, known for the past few years and now a lot of interest is being, is there to understand to what extent this lipid component is essential and where is the line, the, the, draw, the line between the pathogen, trigger, pathogen pattern and that of the symbiont, symbiont pattern. And, and uh, this has been very well uh, demonstrated by a few other groups like where the when the fungus has to dominate, when the fungus realizes that this, his pattern, the, fun, the pattern of the fungus is recognized, pattern, pathogen secretes another kind of an effector molecule which can outcompete the immune receptor binding to that pattern. Thereby, it avoids immunity and therefore the fungus is successful. This has been shown very recently. And another important observation that has come in the recent past is that for the receptor to be active, for the receptor to transduce the signal downstream to the plant cell, uh, downstream to the uh, nucleus, the phosphorylation of this can happen only when there is dimerization of this receptor. And this dimerization is induced in presence of an octomer of chitin. An octomer of chitin 
it cannot be it is not inducible by a pentamer it is not inducible by a tetramer but it can be inducible by a hexamer heptamer or an octamer of chitin and not by uh, uh, the lower oligomers which means these are the patterns which are recognized by the uh, plant for act to activate the pathogen triggered immunity in plants then the question comes now we are probing more in the recent uh, last 3 4 years we are probing further into this whether it is a pure chito oligomer chitin oligomer or is it a, D, a, a some pattern within this chitin oligomer is there is some pattern where some degree of deacetylation can take place where it may form a chitosan oligomer I, is it a pure chitin oligomer because chitin oligomer is able to do this but we don't have specific chitosan or specific pattern of chitosan oligomers available with us we are working to understand is there a very very specific pattern of these deacetylated oligomers which is important for this or it is only the chitin oligomer which is responsible that only the next 3 4 years will be able to tell, tell us on this so this is how the activation takes place and these are the molecules which are used by the plants against the pathogens now i'll switch over to my um, work uh, I, I said we were working with an organism like ceresia proteum acculens which is an endophytic organism an endophyte root endophyte and we were trying to understand what are all the different chitinages that this organism produces what is the way in which they are working and all that in the process we were also working with one of the enzymes like chitinase d we call it as chitinase d which is a glycosyl hydrolase 18 family a protein it also has an additional chitobiase activity that means it can hydrolyze the dimer into a monomer the chitin dimers into monomer but what was the serendipity that i was talking when we were trying to understand the products of this what we noticed was in addition to the hydrolysis products suppose if we started with a dp6 as a substrate we not only found dp5 dp5 dp4 3 2 and 1 we also found longer oligomers here and more clearly seen when we look at dp4 as the substrate we find 5 6 and 7 formed when dp3 is the substrate we should have got on if it is only hydrolysis that was occurring we should have got dp2 and dp1 but we all we get 4 5 6 and all other longer oligomers this is what is the process we call it as trans glycosylation and dp6 to dp3 all the substrates undergo trans glycosylation to make it into a simple cartoon form this is what it is the shorter oligomers are glycosyl transfer is uh, carried out by the enzyme wherein the two shorter oligomers are put together and a longer oligomer is formed where why are we interested in this the oligomers shorter than six are of not much use to induce resistance in the plant and our interest is to synthesize molecules which are longer than six and it is an enzyme which is handy to synthesize such kind of molecules and that's where we are interested in this and this is where we have characterized these molecules and if we start with dp3 as the substrate up to dp7 we can get if we start with dp6 we get up to dp13 and we try went on to improve the activity of the trans glycosylation activity of this enzyme in collaboration with our chemistry group professor lalita guru prasad we had a targeted catalytic center catalytic groove on sol solvent accessible regions and we find several of these mutants show in enhanced trans glycosylation activity several of the mutants show enhanced trans glycosylation activity more importantly we find that the trans glycosylation can be seen much more after six hours when come the wild type has no activity at that point in time this is the summary of all that and we also try to uh, uh, we, we made an assumption that if the uh, reaction substrate and uh, products are allowed to remain in the reaction center for a longer duration the trans glycosylation process may be enhanced they, for that what we have done is first we have mapped the entry and exit points of the substrate and the exit point we introduced a, a bulky amino acid residue and we find that there is a, indeed an improvement in the trans glycosylation activity this is what is the uh, when we introduce a bulky residue at the entry point we find that there is a significant reduction in the trans glycosylation whereas at the exit point we find a significant improvement in the trans glycosylation activity we have also done additional steps like this like to since it was uh, only a catalytic domain we have fused with uh, several other uh, substrate binding domains like uh, chbd chitin, uh, chitin binding protein 
the, our polycystic kidney domain, different kind of accessory domains, we try to enhance the translate oscillation activity of that. We find that there is an improvement there. And we have resolved the structure of this protein in collaboration with uh, Professor T.P. Singh at All India Institute of Medical Science. And then he explained, he told us that there is a presence of a very special novel loop uh, ranging from 30 to 42 residues. And that loop also has played a very important role in trans -like oscillation and also in the chitobiase activity. This is what we have characterized. These are all the finer details of uh, how we have characterized the trans -like oscillation and the chitobiase activity. And the inverse relationship between the trans -like oscillation and uh, chitobiase activity also we have shown. Then we separated the products, the, uh, incubating this enzyme with different chitos with chitosans, we separated the products through size, exclu uh, size exclusion chromatography and then tried to test these are the products that we, these are the, this is the degree of polymerization because our interest is to test the molecules six and above, these are the molecules and this is the composition A is for acetylated residue, D for deacetylated residue, these are the mixtures that we have. With these mixtures, we try to see whether there is an elicitation of defense activity in the plant or not. Yes, they indeed show a defense activation in the plant. But then a lot, of, a lot more has to be done in understanding which sequence, which pattern of acetylation, which degree of polymerization is important and which is the most precise molecule to induce resistance is something which we have to do. In addition, in the recent past, we have also been working with uh, uh, the another chitosanase from Penibacillus algae and this we have uh, recently published in JBC and then there was another one on SM Kaidi and similar things have been done and a lot of things are being done to understand more of this trans -like oscillation. As I said, we bumped into this topic and now we are more interested. A large number of uh, students are working on this particular topic. I need to thank the uh, people who have been associated with this work, Professor Lalita Guru Prasad, who has been my collaborator in bioinformatics work, and Professor T.P. Singh in structural studies, and uh, Bruno Moshbacher, we have an interna international research and training group between University of Hyderabad and University of Minster, where we have collaboration between uh, two labs, and Purushottam has been the one who has initiated that work and Madhu Prakash extended it and uh, Subhanarayan Das is continuing to do that. He is uh, currently the postdoc in my lab. I am supported by, our lab is supported rather by the Department of Biotechnology for quite some time and uh, currently uh, we have two research projects from Department of Biotechnology in addition to the Tata Innovation Fellowship and also support from the European Union and IFP7 uh, on, in a project we call it as a Nano 3 Bio. And uh, I thank every one of you for the patience in listening to this talk. Thank you very much.